I know that you're a gynecologist and a, um, a uh, obstetrician. Can you tell us a little bit about your career? Well, um, yes, it, I, it took me a long time to get around to actually doing medicine. I, um, I did a degree in biochemistry first at London University. And then I did a PhD in biochemistry. And then I thought, well, actually, I really, I, and the degree in biochemistry, um, the PhD was on um, diabetes research. So I thought I'd be a diabetologist. So I thought, well, I better go and get myself a medical degree then. So I went to medical school and then somewhere along the way, I kind of lost the plot as far as being a diabetologist was concerned. Um, I found I really liked surgery and I liked, the, I liked the endocrinology side of it, but I liked obstetrics too. So I became an ONG specialist instead. Um, probably not a wise choice as it turns out. Lots of diabetics in the world these days. So, but, um, but it's, you know, I, I do enjoy surgery. I enjoy the endocrinology part of it. I enjoy the obstetrics. It's a very kind of hands-on sort of profession. So that's, and I, I finished my um, specialist training in Dunedin, did two years as a senior registrar down there, um, doing um, fertility clinic and things like that down there, and uh, lots of laparoscopic surgery, and then moved back up to Auckland, and I've been practicing here ever since. So that's um, kind of where I'm at. And yes, I probably am. I, I probably a lot of people do think I'm a bit strange as far as being a specialist concerned, because I, I do have a slightly alternative bent to a lot of things. But I mean, I am an allopathically trained doctor. So please don't ask me about anything naturopathic. And I usually say to people, I'm not a naturopath. Please don't ask me about herbs and homeopathic stuff and things like that, because that's not my training. I have no idea. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't need to, we need, we don't need to, uh, you don't need to be a, a, an expert at everything, but you sound a little bit like an overachiever. Oh, uh, yeah, I've got more letters after my name than in my name, which is just a bit mad, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, we're, we're so grateful that you've um, come tonight because I only messaged you a couple of hours ago because there was a thread in, um, in our sisterhood, in our TKS group, on vaginal dryness and I thought okay I need to write a blog on that and really need to get into this because the statistics show that women, one in two women over the age of 50 are, are dealing with this so it's it's you know for our community in TKS it's a very real thing and I was sitting there looking into the research delving into the research typing up this thing and then I thought oh why don't I just ask Jeannie if she's available so I messaged you so I'm so grateful that at the last minute you've dropped everything and that you're willing to give up your time tonight to be with us and to kind of delve into this situation, which is, um, you know, much bigger than what I think most women are aware of, because it's not really a subject we go talking about. It's not like you sit down with a coffee on a, you know, on, on a week, uh, you know, at lunchtime with your girlfriends and go, so how's your vagina? Is it, is it dry? Are you, are you dealing with sex pain? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you're probably right. It's probably not a subject that we bring up because usually it's related to sexual activity. So, um, you know, and when you said one in two women, I'm thinking, well, the other ones are not dealing with it then, <laughs> you know, yeah. as in not dealing at all. <laughs> so, because yeah. I think it's actually more common than that. I think most women will suffer some vaginal dryness after menopause. It's, you know, your estrogen levels drop. The vaginal skin gets less succulent, less stretchy, and the vagina is the only place we get less wrinkles as we get older. So it has lots and lots of little wrinkles. It's like, kind of like crepe paper. It allows it to expand rapidly. And, uh, and after menopause, those kind of little wrinkles disappear and it becomes less stretchy. So sometimes having sex is kind of this Chinese burn feeling where you feel you, your vaginal skin is going to rip apart. And it's very painful. And it's very painful afterwards as well. People, you know, say, oh, my God, I couldn't sit down or it hurt to pee. And, you know, who'd want to have sex more than once a year, really? So, uh, yeah, it's a problem. It is a problem. I mean, yeah, and then, of course, you've got all that negative reinforcement. It hurts to have sex. So the next thing, well, you don't have sex, do you? And, uh, yeah. and your little it's lizard brain says, well, it's going to hurt next time. Yeah, yeah. it's going to hurt next time. So your vagina does a little spasm thing called vaginismus. So it tightens everything up trying to protect you. So it's kind of like, yeah, we're all good to go, dear. We've got our lubricant on. We're all turned on. Yeah, yeah, come on then. And then your vagina goes, what, this? <laughs> and... 
the next thing, everything's all tight and it hurts and, and your lizard brain goes, and I was so right, and it's going to happen next time too. And so you've got this reinforcement of that every single time. And trying to break that habit is actually really hard, really hard. So you know, setting up that bad habit is really easy. It takes about three occasions of painful intercourse, maybe even one. And, and then you're kind of stuck in this pattern. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's like, yes, it is a problem. It's, it's, it's that cycle that we yeah. are now creating a neural pathway in which our body responds because our belief system um, causes our physical body to respond accordingly to what we believe. So it, this is where the neural network yeah. is so important in understanding brain training and how important it is to understand where our mindset is operating if we're wanting to change something on a physical level as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And of course, you know, it's it, it's very difficult to persuade people that there isn't any, they, you know, they don't need an operation. Now, why would you need an operation on your vagina to make it bigger, you know, at the age of 50 or something? I mean, it's been the right size all your life. Suddenly it's not. That's ridiculous. So, but, you know, I'm saying, no, no, it's not that. It's just the vaginal skin's not stretchy anymore. And now you're, you're tensing up the muscles there. And it forms like a little speed bump at the entrance to the vagina. You can tense the muscles up. And so, yes, you end up with a friction burn, basically. Yeah. And yeah. It, it is painful. So is this, is this, is this usual? Okay, because this, it, it's, most of it is due to a, a drop in, in estrogen. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I mean, obviously, there's people a occasional have... issue with women dealing with this when they're younger, because I know that about 17% of women from the age of 18 to 50 are dealing with some form of this. And, and that could be due to a number of other reasons, which we'll get into later. Um, but let's go into this kind of drop in estrogen hmm. situation around 50 plus. What, what's actually going on in our body? Well, um, the average age of menopause in this country is around 51. So what, what happens is your ovaries retire. They just stop producing eggs. So your estrogen level takes a big dive. And that affects a lot of tissues in your body, but specifically it affects your gynecological area. So people often experience bladder symptoms too. They get kind of urinary frequency and urgency and have to get up more at night to have a pee and things like that. But the vaginal dryness, it, it's not necessarily a, um, an instant effect, like not having periods anymore. Sometimes it takes a few months or even a couple of years to kick in. And of course, there's always the use it or lose it factor. If you're not actually having sex, then it's going to be more of a problem. If you start to try and have sex, you know, a couple of years after menopause, if you've got a new partner and you haven't had sex for a few years, well, you are kind of a born again virgin and it's very difficult to, to start having sex when you haven't had any, you haven't accommodated that in your vagina for some time. So the, the vaginal skin goes, whoa, are you kidding me? You know, suddenly it's it's got to stretch up to this capacity it hasn't had to do for a while. So it is a problem. So you've always said that we should have lots of sex and I think you're probably right. Yeah, <laughs> it, I do. It I is and that goes for single women as well. So, so there's a couple of funny things. I, I, I don't mean to make light of the situation, but we're going to kind of lighten up the subject because it's quite a serious one. So use it or lose it is, yep. is one thing that you've said. And we, we actually become born again virgins in a sense if we've had a, <laughs> if we've had a break. That could be seen as positive. Um, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, yes. so... so <laughs> So we're body training, right? So, um, so for, for so for couples that have gone through, you know, that midlife kind of period where you know things haven't been so great in their relationship and they've kind of lost uh, uh, their sexual intimacy and they're trying to rekindle it. Um, I imagine that there's there's the there's the bio there's the physical side of what's going on. There's the biochemistry side of things, but there's the emotional. Yeah. And almost spiritual side with, in terms of intimacy with our partners as well, isn't it? Because we need to be in a relaxed state for all of those glands and things to respond as well. So can you talk about that kind of on the, the big picture, whole, holistic picture for, for, for us? Yes. I mean, obviously, we're more than just our ovaries, but your ovaries give you that kind of biological drive to go and have sex mid-cycle. So people often notice that that's when they are most hormonally driven to go and have sex. That's when you want to go and jump someone's bones. It's mid-cycle to make you go and get pregnant. You know, that's the biological drive for it. 
But of course, that's not everything about sex. It's not just about your hormonal drive. And so when your ovaries retire, that part of it does kind of retire. You're not going to get that mid-cycle nice estrogen testosterone peak anymore. But Don't tell me um, that. Don't, <laughs> don't tell me that. I can feel that. <laughs> I, I always say, this is my horny week of the month. <laughs> Exactly. Yes, exactly. I mean, most of us do recognize that at this point in our lives. But yes, that is going to go by the by, I'm afraid. Uh, okay. That doesn't mean to say that there will be no sex or there will, you know, that sex won't be enjoyable. So, I mean, for couples who have a good relationship and kind of, you know, work around this a little bit. I mean, it's not that you you might not initiate sex as often if you're not being biologically driven for it but um but you can you can still enjoy sex and of course it's not the you know libido is a multifaceted thing it's not just about hormones so um which i think is why 50 shades of gray so so sold so well <laughs> we should all write a book like that <laughs> so, because it's all found it titillating I was really challenged by that film. I, I, I and, and, and to me, I was just like missed because what, why, why was, why did it become such the craze? I, I was really actually mm. disturbed when I went and understood actually what the books were in the film. I was just like, what is wrong with us in society that we're being turned on by yeah. this level of erotica? That's, it's not intimacy, you know, and last week I talked about intimacy and we didn't really delve into the sexual side of intimacy, but that's probably quite relevant in tonight's discussion because intimacy is so much more than than sex or intimacy with self. But you know, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I'm I'm glad you kind of brought that up because I th I think we're dealing with um with a with the Western culture actually thinking that intimacy. I, I don't think we understand really what intimacy is in relationship anymore. I think we see that sex is one thing, that's a physical act. It's a duty of a woman to do it. But over the years of coaching, the women that I have been really intrigued by that have the best sex lives are women in their 60s. So this is, this is, this is really, oh, I think... I'm so looking forward to that then. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> And, and I, th I think what it is, is that it's because they are in that retirement phase often, or their lives are winding down. They don't have the pressures and the stress, the financial stuff's kind of taken care of, the children have left, the, you know, and their lives are in a different place. And there's a really big opportunity there for couples to reverse their relationship at that stage and age of life. Now, I'm a big, big believer in, you know, I know that there's videos of me talking about this in the program that, you know, that sex is such an important part of ourselves to, to understand that connection, um, not only with ourselves and what our emotional blocks are, but, but also, you know, developing the, the deepest form of connection we can with our partners. And as we age, we tend to kind of move away from that and disown that part of ourselves so much more. Whereas to me, that's the stage of life we need to run to it. I was, I don't know whether you know much about this side, but I'm going to ask you this question. I've been doing a bit of research lately into something called vaginal mapping. And this may be a little bit in the alternative realm, but what I understand through, um, I'm very interested in Tantra and, and energetic intimacy, which is not non-sexual, but it is, you know, the allowing and the connection of, of two people to meet energetically and form that beautiful um, level of intimacy that can or may not lead to um, sexual intercourse. But, um, but vaginal mapping, apparently there is um, six or seven key pressure points within the vaginal cavity where we tend to store um, a lot of our emotions and our past hurts and our pains and traumas. And my understanding is, is that as we, under, as we work to release these, which um, couples can learn to do together, that it can be tremendously healing um, in terms of revitalizing the energy of that part of our body and, and inviting in uh, new and more um, deepened um, uh, levels of, of, of pleasure, um, for want of a better word. So I don't know, I, I mean, I, I understand you're a scientist and blah, 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 but I just thought I'd mention that, yeah. that there are you know, the alternative view really of looking at the vagina as the seat of our emotions. And so when we're talking about kind of shutting down that part of our bodies as we age and which as you say links into this neural network of our vagina our estrogen drops our vagina becomes um <laughs> smaller which i thought yeah. most women would welcome um, 
and and then we're dealing with the vaginal dryness which links to pain that to me has the potential to add even more stress and more emotional trauma to that part of our body so what can we do to um to learn to release that what can we do to first of all what treatments are available for this okay well i have to say i know zero about vaginal mapping other than the G-spot. I know where that is, supposedly. And even then, that might be a myth. It might be like the Yeti or something. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, but that sounds really interesting. You need to hold a retreat on that. I'll come to that one. Um, I, but, I, mean, they, <laughs> I mean, when women hit menopause, if they experience vaginal dryness, usually I'm recommending that they use a lubricant for intercourse, and it's usually a water-based lubricant. Um, so the ones I, I usually recommend is something called Silk or Glide, which are actually made from kiwi fruit. I mean, they're not green and hairy and have pips in them or anything, but they're, that slipperiness of a kiwi fruit, they've used that. And it's the right sort of pH for the vagina. So it keeps the, the little ecosystem in there, go, you know, the microbiome going in, in good order. Um, so, so those are the ones I usually recommend. The oil-based ones are not good for use with condoms because they cause the... the rubber to kind of disintegrate so that yeah, it's best not to use an oil-based one but um and the comment the thread on the um on the facebook thing i said well you're going to end up with an oil spot on the bed as well as a, as a wet patch so that i'll you know, try getting that out of your sheets it's going to be fun but um yeah so usually a water-based one but even then the vaginal skin isn't stretchy so in order to kind of regain some of that stretchiness um, it's best to use a little bit of a, a vaginal estrogen. It's a very weak estrogen, ovestin, which is estriol, which is, you know, if you're going to classify estrogens as good or bad, this would be a good one. There's bucket loads of it around when you're pregnant. It's a fairly safe estrogen, and using it vaginally means that there's minimal absorption to the rest of your body. So even women who've had breast cancer can use a vaginal estrogen. Most oncologists will allow that. So, I mean, it depends on the severity of your breast cancer, I suppose, and it's estrogen receptivity and that sort of thing. But, um, but mostly they will. And usually that's enough. You use a cream or a pessary twice a week at night, and that kind of rejuvenates your vagina. There are other non-estrogen ways of dealing with that too, but that's the commonest way of managing the situation. And the non-estrogen ways, well, there is some laser treatment, um, the one that's most commonly known is something called the Mona Lisa, uh, which is a lovely phrase, really, for your vagina. I don't know if it puts a nice that's little branding, smile on isn't your it? vagina. But, yes. <laughs> but, um, basically, the, the laser um, does very kind of pinpoint little burns in your vagina, which it's a bit like having needling of your face or laser treatment to your face. It, it makes the vagina heal itself. And when it heals itself, it becomes younger. So you get more collagen and more elasticity and it's and it's more lubricated again as well. But the, you have to keep having that done. You have to have it done every few months. And the other way of managing that is um, injection of platelet rich plasma. So you take some blood from the patient, you spin it down in a centrifuge and you take the plasma part of it and that's injected back into tissue. And this has been used by orthopedic surgeons for quite some time for aiding healing of ligament injuries and things like that. We found all sorts of other uses for it now, including vaginal rejuvenation. So it's your own tissue that's being injected back into you. So we're not using anything foreign from that point of view, but it does the same sort of thing. It, it's like having stem cells put back in your skin. So it, it rejuvenates the skin, but it is something you have to have done repeatedly. So it's every few months again and quite expensive, I would think. I'm not entirely sure how much it would cost, but probably about $800, something like that. I know the laser treatment is that, and they usually recommend you have three of them. So we're talking $2,400 for a treatment to a vagina, which you've got to have repeated every year. So mm -hmm. not... going oh, off, something... doing stuff. Sorry, sorry, I just <laughs> yeah. I missed the last sentence. So with the with the laser treatment, the laser and the plasma are around the same cost, do you think? Yeah, I think so, round about that. I mean, I, I'm actually just looking into doing the platelet-rich plasma because the equipment costs are not that high. So I figure, well, actually, the, co the overall cost shouldn't be that high. But if you spend mm. a quarter of a million dollars on a laser, I guess you want to get your money back. 
you know, if, if that's what yeah. you've spent on a trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have the plasma kind of sounds out. cool to me, though. I, I like the sound <laughs> of the plasma. It kind of sounds cool. I just, yeah. I love the medicines going with all of these things. So that kind of, hmm. and, and so the efficiency rates on that, do you know? How many women are well, likely to be? Well, I, I think it, it has been shown to be significantly beneficial, not only for rejuvenating the vagina, but for people who have um, stress incontinence. You can have it injected a bit deeper into the muscle layer and it plumps up that area so that people have less incontinence as well. So, you know, that's the, that's when you jump up and down and laugh and you pee your pants when you do that. So that kind of incontinence. Um, yeah. So um, it has been shown to be highly beneficial for, for all of those situations. And the fact that it's hormone free is good for people who can't take estrogen. So it does have some benefits from that point of view. So I'm investigating that for my own practice at the moment. And I was at a conference mm, about 18 months ago where I was looking at this situation and they had a, um, a little thing for injecting the vagina and it was kind of like a tattoo gun so it did lots and lots of little injections like a like a, a sewing machine you know and you just kind of basically would zip down the vagina you know and it would inject a few hundred times and I thought well that's a lot better than me injecting with a syringe a few hundred times you've got something that's going to do it automatically so and, and, and the vagina is actually I take it we're under local anaesthetic. We don't actually feel any of this. Is that right? Well, I was just going to say the vagina doesn't actually have a lot of nerve endings for that sort of thing. Um, so, but, yes, you could actually just put some gel on it. Like, like when the dentist gives you some gel for giving you local anaesthetic injection, you can use the same sort of gel in the vagina. And so, yes, I think that would be absolutely sufficient for the whole situation because otherwise local anaesthetic being injected is not very pleasant either. And I think no. you've got to work the pros and the cons of that. Yeah. Mm, so, um, mm. yeah, but I thought that was actually quite exciting as another way of managing things. So, and and I like the idea of using that as an adjunct to surgery as well. So that if someone's having um, a prolapse surgery, instead of using mesh, perhaps you could augment the ordinary tissue, their own tissues, by injecting the area with platelet-rich plasma. Um, you know, immediately after the surgery and maybe a few weeks later and a few weeks after that and see how if that might improve its longevity because the problem with using people's own tissue is their own tissue isn't very good that's why we're having to do the prolapse repair in the first place and so it's kind of like trying to pull yourself up by your own bootlaces trying to repair your vagina with your own tissue isn't that great and we get a significant failure rate 30 percent of uh, prolapse repairs fail within the first two years now, that's quite a lot really so it would be better if we can't, could somehow augment that so that it wouldn't fail or it would fail a lot later or something like that yeah mm -hmm. so yes, as we age does, of... our vagina, does our vagina kind of thin does the skin elasticity and things yes. kind of thin over time yeah, as well it it's a little bit like yeah, skin I mean, on our face yeah, I mean, your skin everywhere gets a little kind of, you know, thinner and less stretchy. And, um, yeah, so, yes, I mean, in some ways it gets saggier, but in other ways, it, you know, it's it loses its elasticity. So the collagen, the nature of the collagen changes. And, you know, we've been constantly looking for ways to look younger by having our faces injected with Botox and fillers and things like that. Um, well, we do the same in the vagina. We're, you know, we're looking at the same sort of effect. Um, and it's more skin, basically. So yes, it will it will respond in a similar sort of way. Yeah. This is so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finding this so fascinating. I didn't even know that these treatments were available. I mean, this is this is giving me a lot of hope because I've I've had a few comments. I've been watching the comments come up, and there's been a few people that have um, tried to. Uh, you know, that have tried various estrogen creams with no effect. Um, yeah. And uh, one of these women, Catherine, would said, out, I can't even stand exam rooms yeah. without oh, no, applying not going injections. To that out. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it could end up being something that could be really of value here, I imagine, to women yeah. that have tried creams and the creams aren't being efficient because what we're looking at here is the body's ability to heal itself, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is. And I guess if you look at it in totally Darwinian terms, as in, you know, passing on your genes and things, when you get to menopause, you've done that. You've had your children and mm. nature doesn't care anymore. 
it does you know <laughs> and and the purpose of re of having sex is to procreate so this is basically you rejecting your partner i don't want to have sex with you anymore you better go and have sex with someone younger of course that's totally unacceptable from a sociological point of view but it is kind of Darwin in action from that point of view. So we're wanting to be, have younger vaginas and want to have sex. And and previously, when we died fairly young and, you know, and probably people weren't that interested in having sex. But we now perceive it as part of our, you know, it's a right. We should be able to be having sex. We should be sexually active. We want to be sexually active. We want to be desirable. All of those sort of things. So, yeah, we are kind of looking for some kind of rejuvenation program, really. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> and yes, some people don't respond. I wish it was that easy. And some people don't respond very well to just vaginal estrogen cream. If you get enough estrogen on board, it should work. I know there was a, a question earlier on about somebody who said that they were using uh, hormone replacement therapy patches, I think it was. Um, that was the only way that they could manage their vaginal dryness. Well, that's just a dose effect. That's just getting enough estrogen on board. The trouble is that if you use systemic estrogen, so you're using a patch or a tablet you take by mouth, then you're bathing all of your tissues in estrogen, which has a downside. So that means that there's an increased risk of breast cancer and an increased risk of blood clotting. Um, so, you know, there, there's a downside to doing that. And, you know, nobody likes the idea of getting breast cancer. Or a, or a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. So um, the vaginal estrogen doesn't have that effect. Now, if you read the little blurb that comes in the packet with the vaginal estrogen, you'd never use it because it will frighten the pants off anybody um, because basically they're covering their medico legal bottoms and they're saying, well, you know, oh, yes, it can increase blood clotting and it can increase breast cancer, but there have been lots of studies done on vaginal estrogen and that isn't the case. So... Um, sometimes you can increase the dose to like three times a week, but usually it's twice a week. And we know that twice a week is very safe. But I do have some people, particularly if they've had a hysterectomy, I don't have to worry about what's happening to their uterus. So, yes, I can put them on a higher dose of vaginal estrogen. Um, oh. It used to be that there were these um, rings that was a little bit like having a diaphragm fitted and the ring had some estrogen in it. But I don't think they're available in New Zealand anymore. But they were quite good because you would change those every three months. And it just meant that the vagina was bathed in this estrogen all the time. And you didn't need to kind of think about it or be putting a cream in or have the dexterity to do that. Because, you know, you're looking at older women who perhaps have um, uh, osteoarthritis of the fingers or something and can't or can't, don't have very good vision and can't manage the applicator anymore. And the applicator is not terribly well designed either. I really should do a better job on that. <laughs> so, but um, it's difficult to clean. It's a pain in the bum to use, basically. So, um, yep. yeah, there should be better ways of managing this. There should be. Yeah. yeah. There was a tablet. So Catherine said, Catherine's kind of said um, that she has tried local estrogen and tried the ring and it didn't work for her. So, I mean, it's it's not a case now of kind of giving up, is it? There's there's still these other options available, and um, yeah. obviously yeah. she's dealing with some psychological um, barriers around going into into the doctor's room and actually being treated potentially with these um, injections. Um, maybe laser might be an option for somebody like that. But I think I think this is where the psychological and emotional side of us needs to be open to the possibility that this is a part of our body. That can we can actually bring healing into our body, but we need to be willing to actually. First of all, you've got to want to do it. You've got to want to fix this problem, right? Yes. I, I think that when you, when you isolate a problem, uh, what what determines the outcome of whether it it's, remains a problem forever or whether we we fix it is the desire to actually seek the answers and go and search and find a solution. So I, I think that there's, you know, not only we're talking about kind of the medical side of it, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the microbiome side of it, because there seems to be a lot of research coming in now um, about the microbiome. And this, this may even be really relevant for women that aren't necessarily dealing with, um, with a vaginal dryness issue at, at the moment, um, that may be a little bit younger or this hasn't kicked in for them, um, or women that are actually dealing with it. I think that there seems to be enough research coming through to support that the ecosystem of the vagina plays a key role in um, the you know in, in what's going on in the body in terms of vaginal dryness. So what I understand 
um, is that we have these microbiomes throughout our body. We have these bacterial families that live throughout the body. We know that there is, um, you know, uh, 10 times more um, uh, bacteria in our body than there are human cells. So by and large, we are actually more bacterial than we are human, if you want to look at it in that paradigm. Um, and that these bacteria rely on us to thrive and live and survive. And we actually rely on them too. So we are living very much in this multi-universe within our own, within our entire yeah. body, um, yeah. where we are coexisting together and they are making us healthy and we're making them healthy. And one of the things that I understand about, um, I, I think this is one, of, again, one of these cycles that we get into is that as estrogen drops and that vaginal dryness kicks in, the body, the, the part of the vagina is no longer dealing with kind of ongoing lubrication and the lubrication that naturally occurs in a healthy body is um, slightly acidic in pH, which enables lactobacillus bacteria to thrive. Now, if that, if that um, ecosystem is damaged in some way, which certain drugs can do, um, we, this is why we get thrush after antibiotics and things like that. There are certain Absolutely. things, there are certain... Yeah, certain soaps, um, if we're using perfume soaps or talcum powders or um, the wrong mm. kind of detergents and things that can have an impact locally as well, then what can happen is that that delicate ecosystem can shift, which can alter the pH of the vagina, which then if the pH lowers slightly, then that's where the yeast infections like candida can kind of kick in. Now, yeah. what I've seen in, in my clinic over the years with women with chronic yeast infections is that they, many women will go on the, on the journey to try and figure this out. They'll take the right probiotics. They'll do the, the, the right, you know, the candida diets. They'll do all the right stuff. But, and, and we'll be able to deal with it to a certain point. And then, the, then there seems to be this reoccurring in, infection. And what I've noticed, I don't know how this plays into what your knowledge is, is that I've seen, uh, I've, I got to this conclusion about 15 years ago. Right, we've got to treat your husband because his ecosystem's just as important here. And when we treat yeah. both parts, that's when we get the breakthroughs. So this then is what I'm seeing in the research is that are there potentially probiotics? Do taking oral probiotics help? Um, and you know, what can we do in order to restore our, our microbiome throughout our entire body? Well, obviously diet plays a massive, massive in, uh, you know, part to play in that, which is why in my program, we, you know, we have living probiotic foods and I'm trying to get that pH right through, through the diet as well and bringing and restoring in this microbiome health. So I just wanted to really put out there for the women that this is not just an estrogen issue, that this can happen at any age, and, um, and that it can be exacerbated by the wrong um, microorganisms living within your body. So is there much coming through the scientific community at the moment? I know there's new studies, I don't know how long it takes to kind of reach consensus within your realm. There is a lot of really interesting work going on about the microbiome. Because I mean, I, and I, I've been, you know, preaching this for a long time as far as the vagina is concerned, because I tell people, you know, we are a, we are a living ecosystem and we live to live. We need to live in symbiosis with all the bacteria and yeast and everything else that live on us and in us. And, you know, if we don't, well, we end up in imbalance and we end up with disease, meaning dis ease. So. Um, you you do need to, and it stops you getting infections. If you are in good, you know, symbiosis, you're you're benefiting from those bacteria, and those benefit those bacteria benefit from you. So, in your vagina, yes, you need lactobacilli to keep it acidic. It's not it's the acidity is caused by the lactobacilli. And so when you are premenopausal and you have a lot of glycogen, that's the that's kind of um, sugary part of the mucus um, because that's what your vaginal skin makes and your cervix as well in response to the estrogen well yes yeast love that because it's got some sugar in it so they would love to go and feed off that but basically if it's too acidic and there's lots of lactobacilli around it's and the bifidus as well it stops the yeast growing if they don't colonize but in this day and age of course there's so many antibiotics being used that we end up, you know, really up the creek without a paddle quite a lot of the time. And and we and also what we eat. I mean, I tell people if you're going to eat processed food, if something's going to live on a shelf for six months, 
without, you know, in a package. It's got so many preservatives in it. What do you think that is doing to the gut bacteria? It is killing off bacteria and killing off the yeast and things which should be living in your gut. So it's going to make a huge difference. So, yes, I do tell people to take probiotics sometimes to help that. But I also tell them to eat probiotic type of foods and prebiotic type of foods because you've got to feed the good bacteria as well to keep that system going. But I think we have just ignored all of this, you know, and generally most of medicine has ignored all of this, too. And it's all coming as a, coming back to bite us now, you know, with lots of antibiotic resistance and things. So hence the increased interest in the microbiome in preventing infection and also managing infections by managing the bacteria other than just going in with a bloody great big sledgehammer of an antibiotic and killing off a whole stack of them. You know, we're trying to kind of do it in a more subtle way now, I think. But I mean, it's seriously, I mean, I never had an antibiotic at all till I was, I don't know, I think I had my first UTI 18 or something, and I had some antibiotic then, but I never had any up until then. But my kids have had antibiotics. Now, part of that's because I'm a doctor and I can prescribe them. It's easy. But also there's this kind of demand. People demand antibiotics. I had a woman today said, oh, I went to see the doctor and they didn't give me anything for my cold. I said, well, other than a box of tissues and keep your fluids up, what did you think was going to happen? Sure, they didn't give me any antibiotic. I said, it's a cold. It's a virus. It won't respond to antibiotic. I said, you'll just get thrush. That's all. You know, well, it won't help you. But people mm. have this kind of demand that they think they're not getting a good deal unless they get a prescription for something. And that usually is an antibiotic, it seems. So I think that has made a huge difference. And that kind of gets into our whole ecosystem as well then. And I mean, I think in New Zealand, we're quite lucky because most of our meats are, you know, our, our stock animals are not fed antibiotics. We have grass fed beef, we have grass fed sheep. And yes, okay, they get drenched occasionally and things like that, but they're not normally fed antibiotics. Things that are kept in sheds, things that are, you know, like chickens that are free range, they have to be given antibiotics because they're in such close proximity to each other that they just pass infections around. And they're very stressed because that's not normal. So we need to eat food that from its source is a good source of food, that it, it has been reared as it was supposed to be, that it's fed what it's supposed to eat. It's supposed to eat grass. Well, feed it grass. Don't feed it grain. That's not what it's supposed to eat. And so, you know, in America, where they're feeding lots of their, their cattle grain, they get lots of problems with and having to put antibiotics in because they're in sheds and they're being fed a rotten diet. And if, you, if we all know if we all eat grain all the time, well, that's not very good for us. And we usually end up sick as well. So, sick yes, living. we do need to eat proper <laughs> food, proper. Um, one food of the other. One of the other. Yeah, one of the one of the other key reasons that chickens are fed antibiotics that people are generally not aware of is because often they they spray them with antibiotics and douse them and they're fed and fed it in their foods. But um, we we look at the chicken packets and it will say no added hormones, you know, hormone free chicken and this whole thing. But actually, when you give chickens enough antibiotic, there is a side effect of that antibiotic actually being a growth hormone. So that is that is another oh. reason why. Yeah, that's another reason why our chickens are fed so, so many antibiotics. So they, you know, how else do you get these massive, you know, birds within three months ready to go when they're, when they're not fed hormones? So that's, that's another part that we're not quite under, understanding about that kind of food industry. So yeah. you came into TKS probably about a year ago. Is that right? You came into the program yeah, about a year ago? About a year ago. Yeah. yeah. How, what has the journey been like for you? Because clearly you've got this, you've got a PhD in diabetes essentially mm. so yeah and then then going through those menopausal years for yourself would you share with us what your journey's been and how you you know how you see everything fitting um yeah I mean I'd, I'd it has been a revelation really um doing TKS I mean it's it's affirmed a lot of some of my beliefs um, and when I was doing my PhD in, bio, in biochemistry and I was looking at people with diabetes and I used to go to conferences and part of the conference would be scientific and part of the conference would be medical. And, and I, I kind of gravitated towards medical and that's why I thought I should go and do medicine. But I was kind of thinking, well, 
we're managing people's glucoses. That's how we think we're managing people's diabetes. But in fact, with a type 2 diabetic, just managing someone's glucose is not managing their diabetes. What we're doing is, you know, someone who's got insulin resistance, we're making them either produce more insulin or we're giving them insulin, which means that, yes, we're managing their glucose levels, but that means, you know, insulin being a, a hormone of storage, that we store more of our food, we get fatter, we become more diabetic. That is not managing someone's diabetes. We're actually making it worse. So, and, you know, and if everybody ate in a ketogenic sort of way, there would be no type 2 diabetes. It's because we eat too many carbohydrates and therefore our insulin levels are too high and we become insulin resistant. I mean, it's it's really fascinating. Um, I mean, I've believed that for quite a long time. I just couldn't find anybody to listen to me. <laughs> and I'm a gynecologist. They don't care what I think about diabetes, really. So I just want to say thank you so much for helping demystify this and giving some potential options. And I think what I've got out of this is that don't quit. There is a there. There are many solutions. Not every solution is going to work for yeah. every woman, but you know there there are there are new treatments that I didn't know. You know, obviously this plasma treatment sounds like uh, something that's hugely viable. That's something that I'd certainly be doing if I was in that situation. Um, it sounds more appealing to laser to me, but you know, laser is not that pleasant anyway, is it? Um, no. And um, Kelly just said we're currently at nine four thousand nine hundred and twenty two members. So that 5,000 member mark can happen any day. This is huge. Um, and and so so don't quit. And so if people, so if women are dealing with a situation, I think there's there's a few components that we need to look at this from a holistic, holistic perspective. First of all, don't give up on your sex life. That would be my message. Um, you know, this this comes back into use it or lose it. Make sure that you are working on your relationship. I'm just doing my advanced certificate because I don't have enough on. Um, I'm doing currently doing a, through strategic intervention training through the um, Tony Robbins Institute an advanced certificate in um, in a relationship coaching. So I'm delving into that big time at the moment. And intimacy is just such an important part of filling our needs as partners to make our partners feel significant, to, to create love and connection and intimacy and things like that. And, and we know that not only are women dealing with vaginal dryness, we could also do a whole subject for the men out there on, um, on you know, erectile dysfunction as well. But there are, there are many options available to, to couples in that department as well. So this is not about, I think, quitting. It's about bringing back the spiritual intimacy and love and connection within a relationship and that, that opens up the energy between partners to have that deep profound connection and and then the bodies will start to respond as well so I think it's a cycle and I think we've got to look where that missing piece in the chain is in order to be able to heal and fix it and sometimes we have to be multifaceted we've got to work on the relationship work on the communication work on the intimacy between couples and then we've got to deal with the physical body and any potential trauma that has been in that body um, around that and as you said it might take one to three times for sex to be painful for a woman to shut down and make a key decision in her mind that that's no longer working for me and I that 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 hurts me um, as, a, as a leader in this field of wanting women to feel more love and more connection and for their relationships to be the best that they can be and having known you know over the years the amount of women in their 60s that are absolutely thriving in their sexual intimacy with their partners now that they have time for daytime sex and you know and all those wonderful things where we're not dealing with the daily pressures of life so don't quit is my advice um, what would you like to say to wrap things up well, um, I would absolutely agree with you on that. I mean, I'm, you know, I think that if you can keep your intimacy going, and I do find that, you know, there's a, that middle stage of your life where people are extremely busy, there's stressful stuff going on, the husband be becomes made redundant or something like that. And it's very difficult. And the people either get divorced or they, you know, sex life dies off. Um, 
but I, you know, you hear really nice stories. I had a woman today come to see me and uh, and she said that she'd been separated from her husband for three years, but they're getting back together again. She said, well, at the time, she said the kids were very, you know, demanding. And my mother was just had the early dementia and I was having to look after her. And and, um, you know, and, and she said my ex-husband got, you know, he, he was dying of cancer. And she said oh, it was just too stressful. She said, and the wheels fell off the relationship and he moved to Hamilton or something. She said, but you know we've kept in touch and they're getting back together again I thought well how lovely you know and she said well mm. I've kind of managed my life better now I'm not as stressed I'm not as busy I've, I'm, I'm much better at drawing boundaries and I thought how great to hear that I mean that's just lovely isn't it so yeah I think there is hope you know and, and sex is not all about whether your ovaries function or not um, and I say, and if, if people find that their libido drops off because their hormonal libido isn't the same, well, that's not the only thing that drives your libido. So otherwise, mm -hmm. you'd only ever have sex mid-cycle, and that would be it. And generally, um, that's yeah. not the case. Yeah. yeah. So um, somebody just made a comment here that um, she Del saying, "I'm sitting here in tears, as it's um, like you've read my diary, Deb." Married for 25 years and love my husband dearly, but have lost our way with intimacy completely. Um, this is, it's such an important subject. And, you know, I kind of started on intimacy briefly last week with the girls. We kind of talked a little bit about it around the physical side of sex. But intimacy is something that I think is just so critical to actually understand what real intimacy is. And it starts with loving kindness. It starts with daily actions of showing up for your partner and filling those six human needs and loving them to the highest level that you can. Um, and, and what happens in relationship is that those, that our spouse or our significant other then responds in meeting our needs. So it's not about what we're getting, it's about what we're giving. And so if we want to change that situation, we need to be willing to show up in our full vulnerability and actually, actually be brave enough to have the conversation and to create the space to say, to, you know, to create that, you know, sacred space where you can sit down with your partner if you're in that situation and say, you know, there's a part of me that I, I feel really sad that um, that we've lost. And and I'd very much like to find a way forward to create more inter intimacy with you in my life as well. And Catherine's just said also crying now, such a profound topic. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so this is really hitting hitting the thing. And, and Louise Mann saying, eyes, look into each other's souls, beautiful place to start. And I think what happens in life is that we forget that there's two aspects to who we are. We have the personality, we have the ego that carries the pain body of all our story and trauma in life. But then what we fell in love with with somebody was actually the soul, the actual being behind their pain, their trauma, their, their, their nagging, their annoyance, their whining, all that stuff. We fell in love with a soul. And intimacy is about learning to recognize that soul connection between two people again. That's where Tantra is, is really important and, and learning to connect with breath, with eye contact, with gentle touch, with mindfulness and things like that. And you bring that into your daily lives. So <clears throat> I think this is, sub, this is, we need to talk about sex on another live, <clears throat> but I'm aware that we've gone on. <laughs> so we need to end this live. So thank you so much for being with me tonight. You're welcome. And, um, it's been delightful. <laughs> I think we need to do this far more regularly. 